ahead. All right. So my name is Sean Aston. I am a professional actor and I've been a member of SAG-AFTRA. Actually, it was just SAG when I joined uh, since uh, 1985. That is my formal title and uh, raison d'etre. <laughs> Very good. David, please give us, right. give us your and, title. Uh, I'm, I'm David Jolliffe. I'm a, I'm a 52-year member, a uh, working actor of SAG and AFTRA. I'm currently a national board member. I'm also uh, the second vice president of the Los Angeles local, a member of our negotiating committee, uh, most senior member, actually. I've done eight negotiations. I've co-chaired it twice. Uh, but mainly, I'm an actor, and that's what I've done for a living uh, ever since I was uh, 15 years old. Uh, now 52 years, so uh, yes, 67. Uh, so that's that, that's. <laughs> don't, that's don't my, look a day over 45. <laughs> I, if I just don't look so. a day over 90. Yeah. Uh, that's my uh, that's my little uh, intro. Outstanding. And myself, uh, Mike Moreno, actor, union member, and host of the Actor CEO podcast, and certainly very uh, very big advocate of actors taking their career seriously. And uh, the moment we're in now is a uh it's a very big moment right we're in uh, obviously there's a lot going on in the world and uh, some of that leads us to this moment of having this conversation about where the union goes next in terms of contracts for actors so uh i'd love to kick it off to you sean and uh, sort of give us some perspective of what got us to this moment uh, for to catch everybody up to speed so that we know what's happening with the contract negotiation and things like that. And then what, uh, what we're looking to sort of move forward to and why it's important to us. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Nick. Okay. So there's a kind of, there's a regular process that happens that uh, if you're, if you paid your dues and you're a working actor, you most of the time don't even really need to be aware of, but it exists. And that is the contract so we're, live, we're working under uh, a contract that we've negotiated with producers. And that it provides for basic minimums and basic protections and, and lots of other, uh, there's lots of other points in the deal. Every three years, that contract is uh, negotiated anew. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you, so, um, so that's where we're at right now. Basically for seven and a half weeks, just at the beginning of the COVID experience, our Screen Actors Guild, our SAG after negotiators, went into a process with the AMPTP, the producers group, uh, and we they spent seven and a half weeks and negotiated an agreement. And so then, what the process calls for is okay. The national board has to vote on whether they think the agreement that was reached is uh, is good or it's not sufficient. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, the national board voted to approve it. So that's that's the se that's two steps. The third step is it then goes out to the national membership. We have 160,000 members. And uh, the, every dues, you know, anyone who's paid up, you know, who's paid up in, with their dues, who's current, uh, is allowed to vote in the, in the election. Uh, it's not an election, in the ratification of this agreement. So there's only two options. You vote yes, go with the, ne the negotiated agreement, or no, don't go with the negotiated agreement. If you vote no, what happens is, it has to go back to the leadership team, back to our own leadership team and back to our own negotiators. And they have to come up with a, they have to acknowledge that the membership wasn't happy with this and go back to the, what they, you know, the bargaining table, so to speak, mm -hmm. and try to negotiate better terms. So there's no, there's no drama in the sense that this is just kind of regularly perceived thing. The drama is that if you look over time, the last 10 years, but even the last 20 years, the contracts for actors have gotten less and less and less favorable uh, in a lot of different uh, ways. And so at this point, um, myself as a member and uh, uh, Mr. Joff will speak to it in a minute as one of the senior officers uh, in, the, in the union and in the local. Uh, that's, that's the other thing I would, I would just set up here is that the national membership uh, is is the is the governing body of the whole of all the locals. There are 25 locals. Right. The largest local is the Los Angeles local, and it it has over half the membership of the entire 160,000 uh, union, and it brings in over 50% of all the revenue that comes into the the to the uh, to the general fund and to our pension fund and like that. So it is a massive organization within the organization and. The board, and I'm a I'm an LA local member. The LA local board voted overwhelmingly not to support this contract. So you and the way I look at you, basically you got this 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 duel 
between uh, between the national union uh, between between the yeah the, the national board and between the, the local and then all the other locals who want to uh, who support it. and the, and they they fall on on either side of the issue so the the this does not have to be contentious this does not have to be argumentative this is part of the process that's been established it's mm -hmm. not a bad faith thing to say no if you wrote, vote it down it's part of the process you say no you know somebody comes out and says here's the deal do you like it you go no we're not willing to live with it and it goes back and forth it's just complicated because there's 160,000 people who might want to speak into the issue. So David is an expert with every minute detail of the, uh, of the contracts and can tell you what the, the basic issues are, but that that's it. We're in a, we're in a moment where we've uh, a contract has been um, achieved and voted on by the national membership. And now the, the, the rest by of the, the national year. board, no, a national board, pardon me. And then, and now the, uh, the mem the membership well, the, at large gets to uh, vote it up or down. So that's where we're at. Well, thank you so much for that uh, exposition and that uh, explanation of where we're at. Um, David, I, I'd love to hear your uh, details on the contract, but first I'd also love to get some perspective of where have we, what is the history of, the, of voting no and voting yes? How many times in the past or how often does this happen where uh, first it's agreed upon between the board and the producers and then it comes to the membership and the membership goes, you know what? this isn't something for us. Let's go back to the negotiating table. How often has that happened in the past and has it ended up working out better for the membership? Well, I don't know of any major contract that has been rejected by the entire general membership, but it is important to note that uh, of recent negotiations, the endorsement from the membership has steadily declined. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it used to be you'd get 90, 95% yes vote that was three contracts ago. It then went down to the uh, uh, high 70s. And I think the last, uh, the last ratification vote on TV theatrical was about 75% yes, 25% no, uh, which kind of mirrors what the votes are in the national boardroom. This time, the national board vote was uh, just under 63%, or just over, uh, it, it, uh, it was 65 point something yes, and 32 point something no. So it was almost uh, 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 one third no, two thirds yes. Uh, it was the flip flop in the Los Angeles room. In the Los Angeles room, it was just over uh, two thirds no and one third yes. Um, and we'll see uh, if that mirrors in the, in the national membership when the vote comes in uh, next week. So let's talk about some of the details then. What are sure. people voting? yes and no on and what are some of the hangups? I know uh, what's, it's interesting that you give us that perspective of the trends in the past and over that same amount of voting period, over that same amount of time, and Sean's very familiar with this as well. Um, one of his most recent projects is on a streaming platform, right? So there have been new players in the game um, that are growing quite strongly and quite fiercely and quite quickly. So there are so many more players when it comes to content and what it is that actors are involved in. And again, you know, across the spectrum voice as well and, and other things, but uh, specifically for screen actors, there's so many more uh, avenues of content that are getting out there and reaching audiences around the world in much broader ways, more consistently. That is something that needs to be factored in. And I think maybe that is where some of the conversation is coming to play of, you know, producers, of course, are very aware of this. Actors see it happening. They see these auditions coming around. They see their um, opportunities to be part of these projects. But is it playing out the same way that it did traditionally um, with traditional television, traditional film and things like that? And this well, is where the details matter. Thank you, Mike. It's, um, yeah, the details, I'm going to get into the details, and that's where all the devil lives in this whole thing. Um, uh, we do have a deal with the industry's largest employer already set in place with Netflix. Mm -hmm. So that's important to know. It's also important to know that uh, there are over 500 scripted television shows right now that are in play. Uh, but there seems to be this dynamic where people are working more and earning less. I think if you talk to the majority, the overwhelming majority of actors are saying, yeah, there's work out there, but I still can't make a living. So that's what, that's what I'm hearing. And, and, uh, and that's what I'm feeling from the thousands of members that, uh, that I'm in contact with all of the time. Let me go through, uh, the, I'll do the broad strokes. First, let me do the positives. 
um, in streaming, which is what you're talking about, Mike, and, and uh, where, where things are going. Uh, we achieved a 26% overall increase in streaming residuals, which is good. I'm going to tell you the bad part of that in a second. The other piece that is uh, good is that we have diverted uh, or we're going to put an extra at the end of three years, uh, 2% more uh, in contributions from 18.5% up to 20.5% in the P&H contributions. That's to bolster our pension health plan, which is good. Uh, uh, to the P&H thing uh, quickly, it's important to know that there's only one, per, one half percent of that 2% increase that's actually new money. The rest of it, the half a percent in year one, another half percent in year two, a half percent in year three, all come out of the actor's wage increase pocket. So it's coming out of one pocket of the actor and going over into the pension and health plan. Now we're a union and we're all here to support each other. Uh, that uh, can be argued uh, good or bad, but it's just an important note for people to have that uh, that's not new money, it's money that's coming out of your wage increase. If you're willing to do that, that's fine. To the to the 26% increase in in uh, in uh, SBOD or Netflix and Amazon uh, uh, type shows. Uh, the problem with that is that they traded uh, 70 million dollars in the first three years of syndication money that spreads over 35,000 individual performers. Can, so I, what Dave, the, can I just can I just I want to just build, help set the t context for what you're saying right there. Mm -hmm. In the negotiation. They're saying the the industry's moving in a different direction. Mm -hmm. Syndicated, paid syndicated television is 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 going away. It's dying out. And so what they were saying is we're gonna couple those two things together. At least that's what it seems like from what I from what I'm looking at. We're gonna say we're gonna increase your ability, to, you know, to your your money in uh, streaming, streaming video on demand. But we're going to take away so, – something's got to come from somewhere is the idea. And we're going to take it away from that syndicated uh, side. So that – I think that is a really bad it's – it's really unfair. I, th I think it's actually – it's just – it's wrong. I, I, can't, I don't want to use any other word than wrong. But basically we're saying, hey, if you made shows in the 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s and early 2000s under the contract where you were going to get certain residuals on a certain platform – even though it's dying out and eventually it'll be gone, the people who, and David can explain the numbers, the people who are, would normally for the, I mean, how many did they get last year? How much money came to the people in that? 95, 95 million last year. Okay, not 95 million, right? And then you're sort of going, you know what? We're going to look forward with the contract and we're not going to pay that anymore. All those individual actors who are owed that money are being, it's just being taken away. And it's one thing if the marketplace uh, places out of paying them. That's the nature of the marketplace. But mm -hmm. if the marketplace is still alive and doing it, people should have to get, people should be paid their money that they're owed. You should just change it and be like, oh, hey, sorry, you know, we, we love, why don't you come work on a Netflix show, come work on a, another, you know, on a Hulu show, an Amazon show, an iTunes well, show. Well, HBO is picking up many of these other old, old shows that were syndicated and now they're in this new platform as well. So like they, it's not necessarily even that they're dying out. They are living new lives, but they're living it in this other dynamic way. And I think that, that your point is very important. Did well, I let, say it right, David? Yes. Well, let me, ref, let me refine it because it's being portrayed. First of all, the union is not telling you this. The union had just said in their summary that uh, we're changing the syndication formula to the new model without explaining what that is and what the losses can be to you. And, and then the, 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 the outside influence is, is, is doing a narrative saying, well, wouldn't you rather trade, wouldn't, aren't you okay with trading $70 million to go get $200 million? Yes, if, you're, if, 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 you, if you just do it in that macro kind of thinking that you can take $70 million to the bank and they'll give you $200 million back, everyone would do that. The problem is, is that you're taking the $70 million out of certain members' pockets and moving it over to another member's pocket. It's, if, if that 70 million came out of everyone's pocket equally, and then you were putting the 200 extra million dollars into everyone's pocket equally, you would have no problem. You would get no issue from me. That's fine, but that's not what's at play. What's at play is that you have 20, 30, 40 year uh, members mm -hmm. who have built up long careers who have a large library in syndication we're now going to have that syndication residual go from $100 down to $10. And that is a huge decrease. Now, the other, the other narrative that goes out there 
on the yes side is that, well, those licenses that are currently in play are, are still going to pay out. That's absolutely true. But then you have to say, okay, then where's the $70 million loss come from? The estimated loss of $70 million? Because those licenses are going to run out. New licenses are going to start. There's a, there, I don't want to get too much in, into that because it gets very weedy, but it is not as simple as are you willing to have $70 million taken out of your pocket to put $200 million in your pocket? Mm -hmm. Because you can have $70 million taken out of your pocket and put into somebody else's pocket. Right. That's the problem. It's the, it's the union's responsibility to make sure that people who are working today are getting paid a living wage, getting, getting paid you know, commensurate with the marketplace for the value they're providing to the shows they're in. But the union also has a responsibility not to abandon people who've done successful work in the past, who, people who are counting on that money. When you, to me, the opportunity cost that you make as an actor and you say, you know what, I'm going to go into this profession as a business person. I'm mm -hmm. going, not just as an artist, but as a person who's going to make a living. And so I'm going to choose to do this business and I'm going to make a certain amount of money, but I can count on, you know, year after year after year, an annuity going, going forward. That's, that's at least within the schedule that was, uh, that had been agreed to, you know, as opposed to doing this other show or this other line of work where you could, you could make money and maybe you'd make more money in the short term, but you're like, no, you know what? I like the idea of doing the work I like. And I like the idea that if you've made it, if you have finally gotten on that TV show, if you finally got to have an arc on a show or you, you were a lead on a show or whatever, and mm -hmm. you have the misfortune of growing old, uh, you're not going to, uh, you, you, it, it's, it's just not, uh, you know, listen, as a, as a, a union, to do that. as a right. union, as a union, we're a lifeboat. And in, in, in being in the lifeboat business, we don't throw people out of the lifeboat to bring others in. We keep the people in the lifeboat and bring the others in. Right. So no well, one if, I, if I'm yeah, go ahead. No one has been a bigger champion and a fighter for getting these EDSFOD residuals up to a a, a reasonable non hobbyist level where people right. could be professional actors. Right. But the trade to me is unacceptable. What we did is we traded the other people's money to then put that money into other people's pockets. And that's not what we do. Right. What we do is we keep that money in their pockets and we go get the new. Right, because if I may, I just want to yeah. sort of point out to Sean's point, and this is something that you know the podcast focuses on all the time. It's called Actor CEO for a reason, but it's because you are a business person in this aspect, just, just as much as you are an artist. And I, I talk all the time about creating a sustainable creative life. And that is what becoming a member of the union hopefully ensures for you is that it is sustainable for you to have this creative life because of the the experience of course and because of the pension that you've built in because of this support and lifeboat as you say david that has been built up for you due to your work and contributions supported by everybody else that's not going to leave you in a lurch 40 years from now well, That's you have, unsustainable. Listen, you, you being in New York, you know, New York actors, you know, you guys are living off of Law and Orders and, and Tom Selleck's show and all of those shows that are shooting in New York. When you went and did a Law and Order, an episode of Law and Order five years ago, or you did, you know, whatever show, uh, you signed a contract. When you signed that contract, you had full expectations that the terms of that contract would be lived up to. Correct. And, and one of those terms was that if that show, especially our dramas, sold into syndication that you would get that syndication fixed residual. Now what we're doing is after the fact, we're saying, you know, that's that, that deal that you thought you signed, we're now changing it. Mm -hmm. And we're now going to diminish your residual and syndication drastically. Let me go on to the, the pension health thing. Quickly. Please do. It's important. Uh, I, I touched, I touched on the increases are extremely important. We have to get money into the PNH plans. Uh, uh, but I want people to be aware that, uh, 75% of that 2% increase after three years. Hold comes on, out you, your, you hit those numbers so fast, David. Just, just what every producer- going, at, the end, at the end of the term, there will be 2% added to the pension and health plans. 1% in the first year, a half a percent in the second year, and another half percent in the third year. It's important to note that the half, one half percent of that 1% in the first year the half a percent in the second year and the half percent in the third year are coming out of your own wage increase. So instead of getting three, three, and three, a 3% 3 increase the first year, a 3% increase the second year, a 3% increase the third year, you're going to be getting two and a half percent the first year, two and a half percent the second year, two and a half percent the third year that's going to be diverted into the pension and health plan. So those three one percents, half percents, I mean, equal one and a half percent 
of the of the total of two percent that you'll be getting at the end. Can you of do the an term. example, David? Can you give a specific example? Well, you know, the the, the day rate is going to go from one hundred and five dollars to one hundred and around thirty dollars, uh, and it's going down. It's it's going up to one hundred thirty. I mean, a thousand five dollars to a thousand thirty dollars. Okay. If uh, and that's at two and a half percent. If the increase was at three percent, it would be about a thousand thirty five dollar. Mm-hmm. Day rate, and then that gets that gets compounded, where that thousand thirty five goes up three percent the next year, three percent the year after that. Instead of getting that thousand thirty five, you're going to get now a thousand thirty, and that five dollars is going to be diverted into the pension and health plan. You got so to explain that. You got to explain that more clearly. The diverted how? Instead of you getting the wage increase, that wage increase, that half a percent wage increase, is going to go over to the pension and health plan. So in other words, instead of you getting 1,030, 1,035 this coming year, new year, you're going to get 1,030. Very small incremental thing. It, you know, it's, you know, it's something that you really don't feel or see, uh, but it's important for, for members to know that, that that 75% of the pension increases over the next three years are going to be coming out of your own wage increase. Mm-hmm. But something I really want to get to that's nuanced, that's very important though, is that when you work on a SAG show, we all know, you know this, Mike, sometimes you go work a SAG show, the other time you're working an AFTRA show. 43% of our work is, uh, is, is split off to AFTRA mm. uh, in a deal that was made with the producer. So the 57% of our work goes to SAG, 43% goes to, uh, to the AFTRA retirement plan. That's not to say that every job you do is split that way. It means that if you're fortunate enough to land on a SAG show, an hour drama, uh, that's going to be a SAG show. If you're on a, on a half hour show on the network or somewhere else that could be an after show, uh, a cable show made for cable, that's going to be after. So um, uh, what happens with when you work on a SAG show, uh, let's say you have a great year. You have a $100,000 a year in SAG work. You're going to get a 2% accrual, which means at 65 years old, when you retire, if you qualify for a pension, you will get $2,000 a year in your, for your pension. That's what you earned that year, 2% of the 100,000. Mm. Over at AFTRA, it accrues a completely different way. You're, you're, you accrue your pension based on what the contribution rate is. So in other words, the AFTRA person is still stuck at 17% mm. because they have been doing this thing called decoupling where they don't, they don't give the actual increase that we got in the pension uh, 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 contribution rate or the P&H contribution rate to the actual after person. So it actually skips over. These, these pension and health increases, these pension increases, contribution increases were, will skip over the after person. So at the end of this term, we'll be at a 20.5% contribution rate, which should be the multiplier that it, at the after pensioner should be accruing their pension at. They're not going to see that. They're going to be stuck way back at three years ago at 17%, 17 or 17 and a half. I'm not, I, I might be 17 and a half percent, but it's a nuance. It's very important that in, to compare apples to apples, when you work a SAG job, you're accruing at 2% of what you earn. When you're over at AFTRA, because of the way they, they, they uh, comp- compute it, you're going to be at about 1% of accrual in a pension, half. So right. every time and, you work an AFTRA yet- job- Everything is, you know, this entire negotiation is happening as a group, right? As a right. unit. SAG after is, is going into this conversation as a unit, yet what's happening is happening in two separate camps. It's happening two different ways, in fact. Correct. Even though affecting we're affecting people two different ways. In, Even in, though the, in that a, regard, with that issue. Right, with that issue. Right. Even though we're a merged union, we still have two separate and distinct pension plans. You have the SAG pension plan, you have the after retirement plan. For the sake of time, I'm going to skip over grandfathering because that's a nuanced, another nuanced thing. Background. The union is couching this deal and selling it as the richest deal in, in history at $318 million. Okay. Well, if you, want, if you want to wrap this up in what the, what the value is dollar-wise, the only increase that the background people got was a, an added person uh, to the count, which is background knows what I'm talking about. Uh, in year two in Los Angeles only. Well, hold on, just, just just so you know, the producers have to uh, hire a certain amount of background actors per show. Is that is that right? They have to hire the first. I think it's twenty or twenty-one 
in television have to be union. But if you have a scene of 40 or 50 people, this is the only place this happens. Can you imagine, Mike, as a, as a principal performer, if you didn't know the person you were working opposite was, was a union person or not? We don't have that dynamic. Everyone we work with is union. Right. Uh, the, in background, is completely different. You have mm -hmm. the first 20 or 21 are manda mandated to be union, but the rest are all non-union. Mm -hmm. So what we and this deal and this deal, they say for the first year they're not going to change that. In the second year, they're going to move it to one more uh, background person out of that large group that that has to be that in to in hire. Los An in Los Angeles only. Mm -hmm. And and the reason why I brought up the three hundred and eighteen million dollar thing was that that one person is valued at six hundred thousand dollars. Well, six hundred thousand dollars is point two percent of the total deal. So that's what background got net. Uh, they do, of course, benefit from the salary increases. Everyone, that floats all boats. But uh, background specific, 0.2% of the total deal is what they got. Here's another big thing. So when the, so when the leadership of the background, uh, the, the advocates within the senior leadership, they, they saw this and they were, it was, a, it was a bummer. They were really bummed out. Yeah, they're not happy. They're not happy about it. And listen, this is, this is the good and bad of being, you know, a union that, that, that it wraps its arms around a lot of categories. We wrap right. our arms around stunt performers, around background, around principal, around A singers, big tent, as they say. It's a big <laughs> tent. And when the whole tent comes together, it's extremely powerful. But you got to make sure you're feeding everyone in the tent. Yes. Yes. So let me go to something else that's also troubling. And, and, and at the end of the day, Mike, what happens here is that you get to a point of breaking because this is going to accumulate into, listen, one thing maybe, two things maybe. But when you see all of this and you put it all together, you go, how is this being couched as the greatest deal in the history of the union? And it's historic and all of that. Let me, I'll give you another example. Yeah, Under another example. And then I would- the Tell them the would, bullets. There's, go there's, well, I'm, I'm going to do the bullets. Under and then I would love to hear some perspective on like what would be the positive things we would be looking for, right? Because that's also helpful for people to know is like, okay, so I understand maybe some things and what's not working, but what could work and what, sh what can I be advocating and fighting for? Correct. What is and, I, and I will dance around. I will dance around that question at the end because I don't want to be sending signals to the employers on what would actually close a deal at the end. I think that but, that's uh, fair. Okay. Um, under 20 minutes. This is where the studios we have allowed, and I don't know how this ever even got started. We allow the studios in the space of new media. When Sony goes, makes a Netflix show or an Amazon show or whatever new media platform. If the show is under 20 minutes in length, there are no standard provisions. It's the wild west. So you know, you know what cross-boarding is, Mike, right? You know that now with 10 episodes on Netflix is no appointment television. You make them all and then you drop them all at one yeah. time. So you know that you can go work on episode one, three, and nine on the same day. Yeah. You know, if, let's say you're the hot dog salesman on the Santa Monica Pier uh, and all the Santa Monica Pier hot dog scenes are in episodes one, three, and seven. You're going to shoot those that day. What happens is if it's under 20 minutes, you're, first of all, you're not being paid per episode. You're going to be paid for the work day. Mm -hmm. And they're going to say mm, 500 bucks, 700 bucks. But wait a second, isn't the, isn't the day minimum at least 1,005 an episode? Yeah, except this is under 20 minutes and no standard provisions apply. This is, this is bad. How, bad. Is that even regulated? Like, let's say it ends up not being under 20 minutes in the final cut. I mean, well, that, was, that was what was said uh, in the it, contract that hired you. But what if the final version is over? Well, then, 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 you, then, you would have a, then you would have a claim. Okay. Then you, then you would have a claim, but well, you just have to make that claim. No one's going to do you it. Have, for right. You. you have to make that claim and people want to work. And you know, the it's, phrase it's, is, it's, is a great phrase. They say, well, that if under 20 minutes, it must be freely negotiated. And I'm like, well, what's free about like being stuck out in the wind. I mean, you're going to have to say there's no minimum pay guarantee that, you know, we have our, our minimums, our screen, our SAG after minimums. That's not there. You could, they could get you down to just a normal minimum wage. They, you know, their, their turnarounds between how much time when they drop, you, you finish on the day and you start the next yep. day that they, they don't have to honor meal penalties. Don't have to honor yep. It's all, it's all freely negotiated. And you know, most TV shows, half hours are like, you know, if it's a half hour show, that really means 20 minutes. Understood. 23, 22, 23 minutes. How hard would it be to shave off just a couple of minutes if all of a sudden it got you out of, you know, tens of millions of dollars worth of, you know, minimums and other responsibilities? That's what that we should be to. as a group trying to protect each other from. That's Correct. exactly the and whole that's, point. And, and that's, that is another thing, another ball dropped here. 
where the union is telling you, isn't this fantastic? And it's not fantastic. It's horrible. Sean and I were talking to an actress yesterday, just yesterday, and she was telling us a story where she was doing a multi-million dollar per episode series under 20 minutes with a big star that was making six figures an episode. Seven. And seven fi- oh, right, right. No, seven yeah. figures altogether. Seven figures altogether. Um, and she was number six on the call sheet. She did nine episodes for $3,000 total mm. at Sony. Mm. <laughs> now, this is just wrong. So, so again, I want to, we're going to talk about accumulation. I can get more and more detailed in all of this, but let's just hit the points. Do Four options, tra- do the options and uh, exclusive. Well, let me do, let me, let me, uh, okay. uh, 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 foreign travel. This is where, uh, two, two negotiations ago, we gave away first class travel domestically. We gave okay. away LA to Vancouver. That would be this now coach where you are, New York, you go international to Toronto coach. Um, Now uh, we were asked to give away business class, first class, foreign, in a foreign country, under a thousand miles. And uh, again, uh, uh, Sean and I and many, many, many others are saying, no, this is not the right time to be doing this. First of all, the studios don't pay full price for airline tickets anyway. We all know that. We all know that thank you to United Airlines or American Airlines or Delta Airlines. I want to get as many in as I can just to keep my points up. Um, uh, those, those thank yous are not because they're, they're wanted trying to be nice. They, they traded that out for the tickets. Mm. Um, so we this, all, so this was this not, this sounds con- like a, this to me sounds like a latte lim- limousine liberal kind of thing. But if you really just picture it, picture yourself, you're going to go, you're going to, you know, you're, you're going to, you have rehearsal or wardrobe fitting when you land in, uh, you know, in, in Charlotte or land in whatever place you're shooting at, uh, your flight is late because they, no, this is for, remember list. foreign, foreign, foreign. We already gave away this domestically two times ago. Well, so you're going, you know, London to Venice or whatever's under a thousand miles in a, a much country. longer trip to be sure. <laughs> yeah, yes. Well, there's st- you, 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 there is business class still. You go to L.A. to London, you're going to fly business. Um, but once you get into a foreign, co- and once you get over into a foreign land, you know, Asia or or Europe or wherever you are, any flight under a thousand miles is going to be coached. Now this is a problem. Well, I stand. I stand corrected. I, I have been fortunate enough to work in many a uh, many a European and and other. Uh, yes, you country, have, my friend. And you and you just in that. That feeling is the same, you know. You're you're a business person. You're talking about that your actor CEO thing, and, and we're looking at ourselves as business people. It's not about um, it's not about oh, I want to travel with my Sharpe and my uh, my slippers and whatever. It's like no, your business. You're gonna be reading your scripts. You're gonna be you know on your laptop. You're gonna be doing your stuff. You know, it, it's it, it's totally appropriate when you're making a certain. To me, it, it's. I don't like the way it gets characterized as a as a kind of uh, you know perk that's ir, 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 like irresponsible or, or unreasonable. To me, it's it's just a basic cost of doing business. Yeah, we you know we have a, we have a unique membership. We have a membership of of familiar faces, mm-hmm. and we also are living in an era of COVID, where each country, uh, all of which are doing better than our own country when it comes to COVID protocols. Uh, not to get, uh, not to show you my political bent there, but um, uh, you don't know what protocols are going to be in place in any foreign country. And this is just a safety consideration uh, as well. And it's, and it's a security uh, concern because of, of our membership of familiar faces that can have cell phones put in their faces and you're asleep on the plane. It's just, it's just a little more safe to be in a little wider seat up front, a little segregated. It's not uh, an elite thing. It's a safety thing. Um, I just picture the I just picture the the person who comes to pick you up usually in a van or something like that. Listen, we're going to go right to the production office. We're going to do a quick wardrobe fitting, and the director wants you to come out to the set. And you're like, that's fine. I just flew. Uh, nine hundred and ninety nine point nine nine miles in a middle seat in coach, and my back hurts and whatever. But that, let me just do some stretches and breathing, and I'll be in a perfect mode to try on clothes and go. You know, accomplish whatever the yeah. Be is. at your full creative capacity, at your full business capacity as well, which is what is required of you. And it, and as you point out, David, in our unique capacity as as artists, especially actors. This whole body, as Sean's making clear, our body, our mentality, our our spirit in many ways, that is part of how we do our job. And again, you get sick, and now three days into shooting, you're sick because you were part of uh, maybe a less 
less clean environment or a less, colleague, uh, a colleague was saying to me, well, co- there's nothing wrong with coach like in principle, but, but, you know, imagine you're going to uh, the plane with the director and the writer and the producer and, and you, you get to the thing and they're like, okay, we're going to see you, you, you head to the back. We're going to be up front. And you're like, well, okay, well, I you, was going to point that out too. Yeah. Well, all the, the executives the, are sitting there. They're, well, they're the, buying the, it for themselves. The why, are, why are the, we different? the executives are actually making an argument that they're even the, the studio executives are flying coach and, and the directors and the writers also conceded on this, but they don't have the high profile or familiar faces that we do. And that's a, that's a big problem. Well, the, um, the, the, the flying coach, like I said, there's nothing wrong with flying coach. A lot of the crew is going to fly and coach. I, I don't have, you know, like there's, it's a question of what is the union in a negotiation with the employers able to bargain for? Is, is that something you, you give up? You sort of go, you know what? It's there, you know, we're, we're no better a human being than other human beings. So I guess we'll give that up. No, the, the union's job is to go negotiate for those postures. And, well, and let's, let, let's, let's continue, Sean, to okay. accumulate what's, what the problems are. Because at what point are you going to say enough already? Hmm. Let's talk about the nudity provisions. Uh, in uh, what we got, the big thing that, that they're touting is that we got 48-hour notice of what is going to be required of you before going on to the set when it comes to any kind of nudity or sexual situations. We have a sister union in Canada named ACTRA. Mm -hmm. ACTRA negotiated uh, in their past negotiation, they got a a, a bunch of things that we didn't. Uh, They got 48 hour notice, but let me articulate for you the things that we didn't get in comparison in a pattern. Full disclosure of what's required, see-through clothing protections, Upgrading background to principle. When a, if a background person is asked to be nude and be in a sexual situation, uh, if you're in Canada, you're upgraded from extra or background to a principal and you get a principal uh, payment. Um, someone must be deemed essential to be on the set. Unused photography must be turned over, destroyed. Mm. The actor can have a person of their choosing on the set. And also the actor can have final cut review. This is so important, the final cut review that they have in Canada that we don't have. You have an understanding, even in a contract or written, that a certain part of your body is not to be shown, a certain act is not to be insinuated, let alone seen, uh, whatever your stipulations are that you agree to. But let's say things get carried away a little bit during a scene and you may, you know, a director may let the scene go for a little longer than normal and whatever happens, or uh, you, you turn a certain way and a certain part of your body is seen that you didn't intend. You know the old term, it's better to ask for forgiveness than to ask permission. So at the end of the day, they, they you know, produce say, wow, this could really bump, you know, ratings up or this, you know, a little more box office if we show this, let's just put it in. And you don't know as the performer uh, that that has happened until you actually see it publicly displayed. Mm-hmm. Up in Canada, you get, you have the oper- you have the mandated re- right to actually see it, to review the final cut before it's exhibited. Uh, we don't have that. And so it is in this era of Weinstein and Me Too and everything that's going on to not have these full protections. And the internet and, uh, you know. All, uh, of, all of it. People's so faces and different bodies, all sorts of stuff. Come on. For us like, let's not, be very clear about that. For us not to have these at least matched protections, to me, is unacceptable. Hmm. Let's go to pay TV, HBO. Hold show. on. There's a couple more like things that I've heard talked about. One is... Um, you know, David just mentioned, you know, only essential people deemed essential. Video Village, you know, is a place where the script supervisor, the director, whoever else is watching it, but it's- Focus, focus it's, puller. Every, focus know. puller pulls from the, of their own monitor. Usually, but the point is people can walk by and they can, they can uh, you know, take pictures or videos of what they're seeing there. It's, it really isn't that hard to codify uh, yeah. what, uh, yeah, look, he's doing the picture, but to codify, say, Hey, this is not allowed that way. Instead of it being like, um, I think some of the languages, you know, if practicable or, uh, you know, uh, good faith efforts or that yeah. kind of thing with Where's no penalties. It? No, pe- so you have to have a, a, a locked in there. Some of these things there, 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 you know, um, there, there's just a number of those kind of things that I've heard the women who are arguing against this contract, uh, and not just women, but I've actually heard men argue about it too, about uh, the way, you know, how long they were, uh, the, the, you know, this nude scene had to go on and, and uh, how long they're shooting it and what, whether they get a robe or done. I mean, that was a negotiating point, whether or not you get a robe to wear if you're naked and you're standing around for seven hours while, while they're moving the cameras around and whatever. On an so, air conditioned set. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> 
Yeah, no, but so, seriously, but, like the people's health. No, I know. Well, it, right? it's, huh. it, it, there's, there's. So those kinds of things are. I know that they were argued for, uh, and there were some movements, but it's not nearly enough, according to some of the people that I've heard argue it. And, and all right, just, let me get like, let me get through three last things because I don't want to lose the nexus of the accumulative effect of at what point does it break your back? Right. Um, let's go to pay TV. This is HBO and Showtime and alike. The residuals. First of all, the residual formula there needs to be absolutely uh, uh, fixed. The, uh, when, you're, when you have a show that reruns on HBO and all these other uh, pay TV platforms, they can exhibit your show 10 days, not 10 times, 10 free exhibition days in the first year. No, no rerun money of any kind. When the show does go into uh, some kind of rerun, the way the residuals are calculated is, is um, in a manner that we uh, find to be uh, unfair. It comes to a point where series regulars will be get, we can get up to 45 times more in a residual than the day player, the dancer, or whoever uh, else worked on that show. Uh, we have found a more equitable formula. It's called our rateable distribution formula, which instead of 45 to 1, we, uh, we split those residuals in a 3 to 1 fashion, where series regulars will get three slices of the residual pie, uh, the weekly player or guest star would get two slices, and the day player, singer, dancer would get one slice. That's what we do when a show moves over to cable and in other distribution platforms. We asked that we change the formula to that rateable distribution formula to more equitably and evenly spread out the money, costing the, the studios nothing. All we asked them to do was to redistribute the same $100, but in a different way. Mm. Instead of giving $95 to the series regulars and the other five to everybody else, give the series regulars $50, give the other people 30, give the other people 10 or 20, um, you know, in, in, in that way. They, the studio said no. Uh, we did not get that. We could. Uh, we couldn't get nothing. We couldn't get something that cost nothing. Hmm. So, so that's the pay television. There, there's that. Options and exclusivity. This is where, uh, especially in the era of of uh, of ten, eight, six episode seasons, uh, where people are locked down. Uh, we're using. Uh, we're well, blanketing. Just to, be, just to be clear. Just to be clear. You do a pilot, and they take a certain amount of time on whether they're going to pick up the pilot. They pick up the pilot, you do a, a, the season, whatever the season is, 6, 9, 12, whatever it is. And at the end of the season, there's a period of time between which they have, you know, after which they have to decide uh, whether they're going to pick it up for a new season. And the actors are held during those periods of time. And they're held for three months, six months, nine months, 12 months, over 12 months. So you, you've done a show and now you're waiting for nine months. Can't do any other work. I mean, they, with a good faith effort, they'll, they'll consider it. But in terms of what's, what's allowed, they're allowed to lock you up. So you can't go and do some other show or some other movie or some other, you know, uh, it, I, I had an experience where, you know, it's, it's frustrating. You, you, I'm so grateful to be a part of the show. I'm so proud to be working with the, the institution I'm working with and everything else. But you, you find yourself, you know, after a couple months, like, mm, mm, you know, I could sure be making, you know, another yeah. 75 grand, another 200 grand, whatever it is, if I did this, if I did this other thing. And I'm, so you, you, you know, it's not, a, for me, it didn't become, it didn't pop my fuse. I wasn't like, this is outrageous. I was like, okay, but outrageous was just about there. You're just on the other side of that's outrageous. You can't let that happen. And, and for a lot of people who, um, you know, it's their first show or they're just really getting started or whatever, or even more established, they, it's hard, you know, it's hard to get that in a deal that they'll let you know sooner. So the responsibility of the union is to try and protect from that kind of you know, I, there, there, is an, there is an absolute reason that they should be able to take their time deciding if it fits into their lineup or to see if, they, if, it, if it makes sense for them to pay for it or to see what the viewership is like or is the viewership uh, loyal enough to the show to, to make it where they should have a, a good amount of time to do that. But not such an amount of time that they're actually prohibiting the actors from making a living during that time. You know, uh, so that, that's, that's a, to me, that's the, a big one. The language, the language that is in place right now was written around uh, an environment of 22 episodes, mm -hmm. network television as a series regular. Now what has happened, that same language is now trickled down to the six, eight, and 10 episode series regular. 
and you're only working two or three months and now you're hung out to dry. And, and for the rest of the year, you can't go out. Uh, and uh, as a friend of mine says, you can't go out and hunt. Um, you know, you can't go out and, and find other work that needed to be, uh, that needs to be fixed. It wasn't right. One last thing, the advanced payment of residuals. This is where you finally grab the brass ring. You booked an hour show on the network. You're number four on the call sheet. Holy mother, I finally, oh, I finally made it. And they're going to pay you 50 G's an episode. Oh, and then you find out later on down the road. 50 G's is your quote. 50 G's is your quote. 50 G's right? is your quote. Exactly. Yeah, and they offered 30, but you went back and forth and finally they came up to 50 and you're like. I'm holding out for my quote, 50 G's an episode. And you say, and your agent says to you, I got you your quote. They're paying you 50. Then you find out the, ser the series goes for a couple, three years. It gets canceled, but it's rerunning. And you're going, well, it, at least uh, to the wife and kids, you know, the, the kids aren't going to go hungry and we can make the car payment because we're going to have some residuals. Yep. Oh, no. Because you find when you look in the details, the dirty little details of your deal, that that $50,000 was really only $30,000 for your initial work and $20,000 of that was the advanced payment of residuals. And now you will never see a residual again because they folded that into your initial compensation. Mm. At Netflix, we, we made in part of our Netflix deal uh, that the most you can prepay, and, I, and this is still too much, is 15%. So we had something as a template to set, you know, a, a stake in the ground with. Right. Uh, the studios at the end of this historic deal can still apply as much as they want. So understand, understand that when you get to a year out of its initial distribution, that's when your first residual payment would come in, right, David? Well, it has to rerun somewhere to get a residual. All right, I mean, but okay, so once it you know, shows shows just go to the nether region. But uh, the, the overwhelming, the business model is to, you know, listen, people are making shows in, in, neg in, in the negative. There's, you know, they get a license fee or they're getting paid $4 million, but it's costing them five or six an episode to make it. What, the business model is that they're going to make that money up on the back end. So the whole hope and want is that shows are going to go into some kind of ancillary rerun be it syndication, be it move over to cable, be it whatever, be it in, 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 but in the event that itself. it does, in the event that it does enjoy, uh, this additional, uh, life, yeah. it's a, it, from the time of the first exhibition of that thing, it, that, it's a year. Is, is that right? It's a year until you get your first, uh, payment. Well, no, the, most, uh, most, most show. No, there's no, no, that's, that's, that's HBO showtime where they get, the, they get the year, they get the 10 free rerun days. You do a network show, but no network show is going to go in. You're going to get a rerun. You'll get rerun money if it reruns on the network, 100% of compensation up to about $3,800, $3,900. But you, you, if you had advanced payment of residuals, you wouldn't get that residual. If you're in the scenario where you booked and you got your quote of 50 grand, uh, and then 20,000 was advanced paid, they're going to deduct that 3,900 rerun uh, in, when it reruns in the summer of whatever show you just did, booked, uh, and, which is going on a, long, uh, you know, a lot right now, uh, uh, shows rerunning, um, especially with nothing, no new product out there. Mm -hmm. You will not see that residual because that will be deducted from your residual so, advance right. money. So unless you're watching uh, Mike's show, Actor CEO, uh -huh. the odds of you actually knowing that are slim the actors don't i you know listen most i've been actors, acting a long time actors, and i don't know you know i'm like most actors are many are now starting to wise up because there's also a question about what's commissionable and what's not commissionable so um you know uh anyway that's a whole other argument but mike i i finished up going through the major talking points and at what point mike did you say you know something enough already I can understand. Uh, yeah, I, can I mean, exactly. And I think to your point, it just keeps adding up, right? <laughs> like, like you say. Uh, and, and as Sean states, you know, as you start to learn more, as, you know, many actors, you know, at, at a variety of levels are obviously very excited to work and want to continue working, but want to make a livelihood out of this and want mm -hmm. that sustainable career. And, you know, I think you learn... So hopefully quickly in this career that saying yes to everything isn't always the wisest move. And if there's some so sort of 
way for you to negotiate your position or learn more information so that you can make a wiser decision, then that actually puts you in a better place, especially when you understand like you don't need to do everything so quickly. You don't need to rush to judgment. You don't need to have a career in two years or you're, or you're screwed. You don't need to be famous in 10 years or nothing's going to happen, right? <laughs> there's, there's an understanding that like you actually have some time. You need to give yourself some breathing room. You need to have perspective to make this the long game, which is what 99.9 of artists want to do. And this is why this is information and, and, and is helpful. Even, and even, and like, as you're, you, you just talk, you're talking about a very patient, responsible, long game play. And I think it's really important for actors to, ha I think it's a great kind of mode for actors to be in. So we're, cause desperation stinks, you know, nobody wants to yeah. hire desperate people. So, but say there is something and you're like, I want to do that. That is an opportunity. I'm going to take advantage of that you want to know that this union you've paid dues for has actually created a scenario where you can at least at the very living make money because it sucks if you get a job and then you're like, oh, wait, that's all I make? You know, right. it's like, I don't care. I don't care what I make. I just want to be in it. At a certain point, you're going to care what you make. Certain you know, point, you rent make, is due and, you know, you, yes, your car payments due, right? And, yes, you know, and, and, and you want, kids are going to school. Like, come on. And, at a certain and point, you, you only care. have, there's only a couple moments as an actor like I really never paid much attention to my contracts. I was I had good fortune and I worked regularly throughout my whole life. But but there were certain moments where I, I would have questions. Wait a minute, they what, lost twelve hour turnaround. That was like sacrosanct. How do we lose that? But but you at certain moments you actually can affect the process. Mm -hmm. And one of them is when you vote for elected officials. And one of them is when you vote to ratify a contract or not. There's actually other opportunities you have. These things called W and W's where you can, the wages and working conditions where you, you can go and, and wait in line and go to the microphone and give your idea or your thought or your concern. And there's supposedly a mechanism for absorbing that energy from, from, the, uh, from the membership. But, but the real decision-making opportunity is when you vote for your uh, elected officials and when you vote on whether you're going to accept a contract or not. Those are the mm -hmm. two moments. And they really don't, take much time at all <laughs> you know you it's nice if you have a general sense as you move along of like what's basically happening and you're talking to your friends and colleagues and like what do you think of this and you know that there's resources well check out that website or whatever but when it comes down to it you just push you just you just type in your code and you vote yes or no on this one and 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 the overwhelming sense of the, from the from the leadership of the union is this is a foregone conclusion they're, mm -hmm. they're promoting very heavily as, as they should, to a certain extent, let people know uh, that they've negotiated a deal and they want it to pass. They shake hands with the, with the negotiators and they want to go do their best, but it's not right for them to overstate uh, a, a, a negative position. You know, they say, for example, oh, we're, if we don't ratify this now, we'll never get as good a deal or, uh, you know, or uh, they, or, you know, whatever, or there'll be a strike or whatever. And I think it's okay for them to reasonably uh, suggest uh, that people consider the ramifications. Like that's, that's their job as leaders. Mm -hmm. But in this particular scenario, they've actually, oh, I almost said the wrong, a bad word. They've actually something blocked. They've blocked the uh, dissenting opinion. They allowed a dissenting opinion to go in the report that gets sent out, but it was only 500 words. Imagine distilling 12,000 pages into 500 words. And, and it was at the bottom of a 17 page thing or whatever, it was at the very bottom of a long document. And, and they've, they've worked really hard to use all the apparatus of the, of the union, the, the mailer lists, the, the, uh, the, the PR departments, the data analytics, they, they have, it, it's, it's great that we have access to that. But when you say, uh, a huge number of people in the national boardroom voted against this. More than our president, the president of our local, Patricia Richardson, said she's never seen it. David, you could say she'd never seen that big a negative vote. They won overwhelming. They 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 voted, it. but of the negatives, it was much higher than ever before. And then for the biggest local union in the in the uh, local in the union to vote two thirds with a super majority to not support this agreement, that means that there is real opposition to this. And when you have that kind of serious opposition, you absolutely have an obligation to present your members with the real facts. They've, other, they've done other things that are just not okay. Like you go onto the website and there's only a yes button. Like, where's the no button? I get a yes or a no, right? And, and if you're sitting there and you're worried or whatever, and if you finally like push the yes button, then the yes and no prompts up. But it's this kind of like, you know, most people look at it and they think, oh, well, my, my union wants me to vote yes. So, you know, I want my union to support me. I'm not paying that close attention. I'll vote yes. It's like, well, no, 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 no. Hold on. Hold on. 
you can actually, and this is another point that I make, you know, if people are operating in good faith, that's a legal term of art. If people are operating in good faith, then things should move in the right direction. The process allows for this to be sent to the membership and the, for the membership to vote yes or no. If it's, not, if, it's, if it's bad faith to vote no, what's the point of having a vote in the first place? Mm -hmm. So we can vote no, and we can do that in solidarity with our leaders who want us to vote a different direction. And we can say, hey, you've got the wind at your backs now. You go back to the table. You've, instruct, you've been instructed by your membership to go back to the table. They can, go, they can go to the producers and say, listen, we tried to sell this thing. You saw our efforts to try and sell this thing. It just wasn't good enough for them. So now let's all sit back down to the table and let's try and figure out what of all the things that David said. And there are a lot more. Well, uh, what can we reasonably attempt to get? And you don't want to pre-negotiate it in a conversation like this beforehand, but you know, there's certain things that don't cost them anything financially. You know, one thing you you didn't mention, David was, um, was, uh, or maybe you did and I just, uh, I, I didn't hear it. Uh, uh, uh coordinators, mm -hmm. uh, uh, intimacy coordinators, mm -hmm. intimacy coordinators are, uh, like stunt coordinators. You're going to do a stunt with a guy falls in a building. You have somebody who's there to coordinate. You're going to do a love scene. You have somebody who can help. Show, yeah. Yeah, right. So they exist in some places, but but the concept was, well, there's only 40 or 30, I don't know the number uh, that exists. So we don't want to codify it because there isn't the, the, the labor force to fill that job. And you're like, come on, there's 40 million people out of this, out of work in this country. And they've got plenty of time now while we're in this. COVID and the contract situation. plays over a number of years. You don't yeah, think or, by or, the or, end or, of three years, there's going to be more. Yeah. So seen do how that. quickly do it's grown already. Build, yes. Exactly. And they have it in, and they have it in Canada. And they have it in Canada. Which you, so I think you let, already said it, but. Mike, let me just wrap uh, what I want to say, need to say, if you'd allow me. Thank you. Um, I've been a member of SAG and AFTRA for 52 years. I am a devout unionist. I have dedicated 25 years of my life to be of service to both the Screen Actors Guild and AFTRA. I have served on more committees than I can count. I've been a member of 30 plus negotiating committees. I've chaired 10 of them, from animation to dubbing to commercials to TV theatrical. This is what I do for a living. I am a die hard unionist. I'm very troubled that good, good people like Sean Astin and myself and others, I won't name right now, are somehow being portrayed as against our union or anti-unionists. Nothing could be farther from the truth, but the truth needs to be told. The union itself is not telling the entire story while they are asking, not just asking their members for a vote, they're telling them how to vote. And they're not telling the members that money is going to be taken out of their pockets when it comes to syndication. Uh, and they're painting a picture that is not Again, telling the whole story. It's not a fun thing for people like Sean and myself to have to come out, expose ourselves, not just to retaliation and retribution from, uh, from our own fellows, but from employers. To have to come out and say, this deal isn't good enough. It puts targets on our back, but I'll speak for myself. I'm willing to do that for the common good. That's what I am. I'm a unionist. I can't drive by a car wreck. I have to stop and try to help. That's just my nature. In this case, I'm seeing a car wreck and I've got to help. I know what the details are of this deal. I'm extremely troubled that the union is not articulating them in a, in a fashion where people can, can discern what actually is going on here. And I know to my core that if the membership of this union turned this deal down, that everyone involved would be forced to do better because, you know, the studios are, you know, <laughs> I cannot imagine the head of a studio saying, wait a second, the reason why I'm having trouble not getting the actors on the stage is because uh, they want three extra background people and they want to have an int intimacy coordinator on the set and they, and they want to be able to review the final cut of a nude scene that they did. Are you telling me that's what hang is hanging this deal up? And I don't think the town would shut down over that stuff. Now, maybe I'm saying too much by saying that, but th that's what I believe. And so that's why I'm here. Sean can say why he's here, but it's, uh, it, this isn't fun, Mike, <laughs> to do this. Talking it's, to me uh, is a hoot. You love talking to me every day. So <laughs> well, I like talking to Mike, but that's, here's, anyway, here's I didn't want to get too here. Melicon, but anyway, that's my spiel.
Well, your, thank you for your, that. Your union service, David, is is uh, is absolutely revered by everyone and even the people who are sitting opposite you in the room and who are so frustrated with you and, and your intelligence and your knowledge your deep knowledge of the facts and everything else they people respect you and uh, and that is that that's uh, a hard won hard earned uh truth that you've that has cost you so much time in your life to do it and and discipline and you know i've seen you make a lot of decisions that are you know that are principled decisions um, and it's, it's fun to watch. That's fun to watch for me, but here's my thing. So my mother was president of the screen actors guild in the mid eighties, mid to late eighties. And, uh, and I grew up in a house where, uh, there were meetings with actors. Who was your, uh, you know, who was your mother? Who was your mother? <laughs> my, my mother was, oh God, that was a good setup line. But, uh, my mother was Patty Duke. Uh, my father was John Aston, actually a friend of ours in our, in our little, uh, group here is keep saying, why don't you say your father's name too? And so my, my legendary father, John Aston, but my mother was the president of the union. So that's why I always mention her. And, I, and it was, it was really fun to grow up in the house and be running around. I, I, I can remember some of my earliest memories were watching these people from, from uh, Adam 12 and engine 51 or uh, emergency. Uh, and you know, those, those kinds of shows and Duke to hazard and like, Oh, I'm, I look at my TV and then I'm looking there in my living room and you're like, Oh my gosh, that is so cool. So, um, here's the thing when I'm on a set and I look around, I don't like the feeling when they treat the background actors like they're uh, second class citizens. Mm -hmm. It makes me feel uncomfortable. You know, I understand if there's a large group of people who need to eat and there's the core, uh, you know, the, the top 10 on the call sheet who need to eat and they have to get back into wardrobe that there, there may be some, you know, some urgencies, but there, it's not too hard to make considerations to, to make sure that background players don't feel that way. I actually find that background players are vastly more educated about the contract than other people. Uh, one issue we didn't, it's my core issue that if they go back, I'm going to be standing with a flag talking about like, go for this one. This it's the stunt thing. They have these things called stump breaks, which I've only heard about 4,000 times and still don't understand, but this is what I do understand. If they work a weekly contract, for example, uh, and, and 40 hours, and then you know they end up working 56 hours, so 16 hours of overtime, you know they, they get their base rate and they get their overtime. In the stunt world, I, if you guys don't know this, uh, most people know this, but if you don't know this or some people know it, I've noticed since I was a little kid because I, I worship stunt performers. I just love what they do. Um, guys jumping off of trains, landing into cactuses and, you know, horses. And like, I just, I just, they, they're just really, really brave people. And, and they're, it's awesome what they do. So, um, so if they do a stunt, a big stunt, like jumping off a building and get, get set on fire and jump off a building and land in an airbag or something like that, that's a very dangerous activity. Mm -hmm. So they get together, the, the, the process is they get together with the producers or the line producer and the stunt coordinator and the stunt person. And they make a decision about uh, an adjustment, a bonus, a bump a tip, whatever you want to call it. It's a chunk of money. In that case, it might be as much as $15,000. So great. So they got their base pay, they get their overtime and they get their, their, their adjustment. And when they get to the end of the week and they go to get their check, all of a sudden they look at it and their overtime has been reduced from 16 hours down to like two hours or it's gone altogether. And they go, oh no, actually I worked overtime. And they go, yeah, but we deducted that overtime money uh, from your stunt adjustment. So you can look at it either way. They're either getting their stunt adjustment deteriorated or they're getting their, their, and this is just a new, they fixed it in television in the last deal, but they haven't fixed it in film where most of the, the lion's share of these kinds of stunts get done. So mm. to me, you know, if I have, if I can play some small part, you know, by speaking out or whatever, or trying to persuade my friends or, or just, you know, putting, you know, putting my name on something, uh, the next time I'm on a set, if a stunt guy or girl does that, uh, that adjustment and walks over to me and says, hey, thanks so much, I heard you, you helped with us, you know, protecting the adjustments, that would make me feel like a living God. I, I absolutely, you know, there's, it's so hard to look after each other in this world. Right. And, I, and I'm not taking, I don't want to disparage in any way, shape or form, the hard work of the negotiators or the staff or the volunteer members of the leadership who negotiated this deal. I, I don't want to disparage them at all. I wasn't in the room. I don't know how it was negotiated, but I can see the trend that's been coming of the, of the contracts over 10 years and some of the losses that I actually noticed because it affects me personally. Um, and, and, and I see what comes out and I go, okay, well, is there anything to be done about this? He's going to go, actually, yes, there is. There's a very simple thing can be done. It's not a strike vote. People say, well, the only way you can force them to do this is if you get a strike or a strike authorization. And like, no, we're in COVID right now. 
No one is working right now. No one is going to be working for a while. They might try. I know we tried for a little bit, but the numbers are going bad. So for the, for the you know, short period of time or medium visible period of whatever, that we're not at work. We are all in the same boat, the producers and the mm -hmm. actors and the writers and the directors. And we're all in the same boat. We're all going to be desperate. We are desperate to get back to work. We don't want to slow that down at all. And so I think reasonable minds, you know, the, the way they design these negotiations is to put layers of lawyers, uh, dispassionate people in between the, their bosses and the, and the other side. And, and, and that is, that's okay because it is business and business is business and you got to do business. And we're on a bit, this is where it's our side. It's a business, their side, it's a business. We're doing business, yep. but there are human beings. And my feeling is if you're, they're not being threatened or attacked or called uh, monsters or anything like that, because they have all their own issues too. I just don't want their issues. You know, they said, this is hard. We're shut down. And they're very, they're, they're very, uh, you know, emphatic about the, the distress that their side of the business is under. Well, whose job is it to be emphatic that we're under distress? Mm -hmm. It's the union's job. And if the union isn't supported by its membership, it's not really a union. So I am encouraging my friends to support our leadership by not ratifying this contract and asking them to come back. I'm going to be sitting with my, my ratify vote, my finger on the button to actually make this deal. I'm going to be so proud to agree to the deal when it comes back, when it's been enhanced, because I'll know that we had a, it wasn't just our elected leadership who operates kind of remotely from us making a decision. It's, it's us. we now, there's a real, there's a real opportunity here to vote. No. And that was, that is not, was not the case when this started. And so if people take this wave and they do that, we, we can say, hey, we were actually participated in this moment directly. We had direct participation. So, uh, so that's, that's what I'm going to do. I, I love my union. I'm proud of my union. I want the card that I have, my sag after card. I want to be able to hold it with pride. I want to know that whatever sacrifices I've made in my, that my team has made on my behalf, I want to know that those sacrifices are sacrifices I can live with because I believe that they did all they could. And now we know they haven't done all they could because they haven't gotten a no vote and gone back to see what that means with the wind at their backs from the support of their membership. Hey, Mike, have, yeah. we, have, we, gone over, have we gone over 20 minutes? Yeah, we, we nailed the 20 minute mark for sure. But you know, I do wanna, I, I wanna thank you both very much um, for of course your advocacy and uh, you know, your strong work in the union um, from many different sides, but also, being able to come out here and come on a show like mine or wherever and voice um, this other information, right? Voice the ability for actors to learn more, right? And I agree with you, Sean, um, that, you know, that card needs to represent more than just you, right? It's not just you and your membership in the union. This card stands for everybody that you're working alongside, who comes to work after you, who gets there before you, who's been there before you, that, that's what that represents. And uh, in order to include everybody, everybody has to have all the information available to them. And everybody has to then understand that they're working together to try and help support this in the long run. And that's what the negotiators are doing. And that's what you do by voting. So thank you both for bringing some clarity to that and thank certainly you, bringing some uh, support to that. I appreciate thank it. Thank you, Mike. So uh, the you can find all of the support materials for the leadership that wants you to vote yes on the SAG website. If you want to have the leadership, the, the information to understand why people think you should vote no, there's a, there's a website, dissentingopinion2020.com. Uh, dissentingopinion2020.com. And remember, the, the, I, don't know, when are we, I don't know when we're airing, but the, for the final day- As soon as day, possible. <laughs> as soon as possible. Well, that's great. Well, the, the vote has been open for a while. Many people have voted, uh, but you, it continues until the 22nd. So, you know, people have an opportunity to do that. Don't forget, don't get, don't get busy, you know, don't, <laughs> don't get occupied doing other things. Just, just get that vote in and, and we'll, we'll see, you know, and I did, I'm not sure if, yeah, you, we mentioned at the beginning, but the total, there's 160,000 members of the union and likely right. 15,000 will vote. Exactly. So, no, no, no about, how many, uh, how many? Maybe, maybe 20, but you know, last time was, I don't want to give a percentage, but it's not very high. <laughs> and I think, okay. you know, to, to make, hopefully to your point, Sean, like the, the idea is like, how can we encourage more engagement in this thing that you hold on to, right? It's not just allowing you to work on this set and for you to earn your paycheck. 
you being engaged in this process, especially in the voting process, these two processes that you have access to, as you pointed out earlier, allows you and so many others to benefit so much more from what this membership represents. Yeah, there's lots of there's lots of ways to um, engage. You know, they send out letters, the webs, they have t town halls, and they do you know podcasts, and there's lots of ways to engage the union. But when it comes to how do you affect the the bottom line, your bottom line, and the bottom line of your fellow uh, SAG after members? It's it's the contract. That's that's where the rubber meets the road, you know. And then uh, and there's a lots of, there's lots of people on both sides. So there's you know I I have friends who who vote uh, yes, friends who don't care about voting, friends who vote no. There, there's no reason for this to be acrimonious. There's no reason for it to be disappointing. It doesn't need to be like national politics where you're either entrenched in this viewpoint or that viewpoint. You know, there, there's been a lot of issues in the boardroom over over the last you know since, since my mom was been since the 80s, but. I, you know, there are opportunities to bring, t bring people together. And I believe in my heart that this is, this is one, <laughs> this is a good opportunity to actually bring people together. That's great. Yeah. Well, th again, thank you both. And I encourage everybody to uh, check out both websites for more information and uh, absolutely vote. Cause that's the most important thing at the end of the day. That's thank correct. you, Mike. Active CEO. You.